Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 513, the Tuesday edition. Of course we have Tuesday editions, because sometimes we're too busy to record on Mondays. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashton, and it's June the 25th, 2019. Okay, this is the type of episode I want to be sure that you do what you do as a viewer before you listen to the episode. I need you to like the episode, really, before you watch any more, like it. Seriously, because you're not going to want to click that button after you watch the episode. Please share this episode before you go any further. For the love of God, click the share button and send it to all your friends, clergy, mm -hmm. laity mm -hmm. alike. Um, if you have not subscribed, now is a good time to subscribe because I think at the end of this episode, you're not going to want to subscribe. Comment. Oh, you're going to want to comment on this episode. This is the type of episode we don't like to record because it's news, it's hard, it's difficult. We spend a lot of time in pre-show saying, how do we report this stuff as Christians? And uh, George, how do we talk about vacancies in churches as Christians. But before we do, Kevin, yes. I want to make a commercial announcement. That's right. Friends, I want you to help me save the Episcopal Church of the United States of America. And the way we're going to do that is taking back good churches one at a time. There's a parish that's opened up in Boston called the Church of the Advent. It's one of the flagship citadel churches of Anglo-Catholicism. They're now going through a search process. Now, my name would be poison because I am as an evangelical as they come. Don't let the collar fool you. But if, and this is the church where Richard Holloway, later to become Bishop of Edinburgh was, this is the mother church of the Anglo-Oxford movement, Anglo-Catholicism in the United States. If, and they do hire foreigners. I mean, people, not just people from California foreigners, <laughs> but real foreigners. English. <laughs> If you would like to take a look and you don't really want to be put on the spot by asking them directly for the parish profile, ask me and I'll send it to you. Uh, my name wouldn't help. It probably hurt. But do folks, if you're, if you're English, if you're Canadian, and there may even be a few Australian Anglo-Catholics who may look for this opportunity to help, you know, restore the church to its glory days. Commercial over. Commercial over, okay. So on to the news. The story we're talking about has been brewing for a long time. And finally, we're seeing that the newspapers are starting to get wind of it. So we probably need to put uh, our feet in the fire and let people know what's going on. Gavin's going to speak to this. George is going to speak to this. I'll do the lead into this and, and duck out of here. <clears throat> because this story affects everybody. This story affects uh you know, uh, England, it's like if somebody pushed somebody over the cliff and before that person fell off, they grabbed somebody and fell with them. Uh, a lot of people are going to go down with this story. Uh, there's lots of victims of the story. There's lots of people who knew about the story for a long, long time and haven't said anything all the way up to the highest office in the Anglican Church. So I'm going to lead this over to Gavin because it's largely a Church of England story. Uh, he got let, kicked out. Let, 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 no, 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 I can't no, just no, pass the buck. No, I want to no, pass no, the no, buck. No, I don't no, want no, anybody no. to say, Kevin, "Look what Kevin did." <laughs> no, Kevin, we rehearsed this. <laughs> no way. <laughs> we've got to. Oh, we've got to That's seem clever favorite. and approach this obliquely because no, we yeah. just jump in. No, people, no, people we, will never watch it again. So <laughs> let's talk about recent items in the news. That's good, Gavin. Yes, somebody you knew in your clergy career just died the disgraced bishop of gloucester peter ball died on monday or was it sunday night and how why would peter peter ball's name be known to our viewers can you tell us gavin about him peter was an extraordinarily gifted christian who had a very dark side he played homoerotic games with young men uh, whilst on the surface conducting a public ministry of the most enormous success within Anglo-Catholic circles. Uh, I was a great fan of his. I loved him very much. I once saw him hold a group of 400 international psychiatrists in the palm of his hands and evangelize them. He was good, but he was also bad. Broken. 
yeah, he had this penchant for young men. And and the thing was, he 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 took it right up to the wire and just a bit over. He he. Um, I mean, the first time I met, I heard about him was I was in Eastbourne in 1981 uh, on holiday in a clergy free clergy mm. flat, and I went shopping and met a, a a woodworker in the marketplace. And he heard I was a priest, and I, and we began talking about Jesus. And he said he'd just been baptized, and then he said, "Is it very common to have the sign of the cross imprinted on your genitals during baptism?" And I said, <laughs> I, "I said no." No, I, it's, it's just I an English thing. It's, <laughs> and, it's so in an old prayer book somewhere. Oh my God! I'm told Saint Augustine recommended, and I say, well, not in the Confessions edition I read. Anyway, so it, it, he it turned out that he'd been baptized by Bishop Peter Ball, and we were both a bit surprised by this liturgical development. <laughs> but um, but what do you do? Uh, we 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 just both stayed surprised, and the, the thing is, it, it turned out in the end. Um, Although people are very rude about Peter Ball's sexual proclivities, uh, they were on the whole only just over the line. I mean, they involved manipulation. Some poor man killed himself. Uh, he was never held accountable. He took in everybody, uh, from me to, to Prince Charles, not that, that either. <laughs> that's a particularly impressive scenario. But, but, uh, and then he was sent to prison. Uh, and one of the thing, one of the lessons everyone learned from this was, we mustn't let charismatic, good clergy with dark secrets flourish unaccountably. Amen. Part so, of the, part of the the legacy of the Peter Ball episode was is that this is essentially destroyed the legacy of George Carey. George Carey yes. was accused of not exercising sufficient oversight or not believing the victims. And Justin Welby, or two years ago, has, for all intents and purposes, laicized George Carey, not allowing, uh, ref uh, encouraging Ox Oxford Diocese not to allow him to be an assistant bishop anymore. Um, and so many people who were not perverts, who were not engaged in this activity, had some <clears throat> inkling of it. And those in responsibility, as has been accused George Carey, as he's been accused, took no action and that's you know the the, the bad acts of one person the cover-up of the nixon question what did you know and when did you know it mm. was has been raised against george carey against john hind the bishop uh against his predecessor i mean this has really done tremendous harm to the traditional catholic movement within the church of england Huge because I mean, of yeah. this cover-up not the the acts of the of the bad man were one thing, but the institutional and tribal cover up is what has really been the lasting damage. It might, yeah. yes. And here we have a story with uh, Bishop Ball about a person who was considered a good, considered a Christian, was doing the works of the Spirit, was fruitful in his ministry, uh, but was very broken inside. And that does not just apply to the Anglo Catholics; uh, they get a lot of press. Uh, obviously, and we are going to kind of divulge a story of evangelicalness uh, uh, having the same problems. And this is probably a good transition time. Well, I, I think one of the things we should say is that this puts us in a very uncomfortable place because with, with the gospel passage in mind of the woman caught in adultery, we are not entitled to throw stones mm -hmm. and we don't want to. So we're not going to name the person who's at the heart of this latest development. And if that looks a little, so you can be found by Googling. Uh, it's, it's one of the ways in which we're trying to uh, place this in a context that is as much pastoral as judgmental. I, I, I've been listening to Robert Barron and Jordan Peterson to a tremendously impressive podcast. And one of the themes all the way through is that if only the church knew how to balance justice and mercy, it, it would do better. It usually slips over too far to either justice or mercy so we're going to try and get achieve that balance as we talk about it and if if if, if it seems we're not doing it very well i hope you'll you'll forgive us and uh, understand what we're trying to do now i think we should say that the impetus for our breaking this story is that it has now made its way into the secular press it was was it not the telegraph i believe on june 21st or 22nd that broke a story 
uh, concerning a prominent retired evangelical minister at the Church of England. See, it was a bit weird, George, because it was it was all was this particular uh, pastor in the Diocese of Southwark had been suspended for spiritual abuse. Now, no one really, spiritual abuse is a new term, and it's, it's going to be a slippery, slippery and horrible term that will be used badly to catch people out. But as yet, it's quite a new term. So they didn't say what the spiritual abuse was. Out of nowhere, they just said, this man's been suspended. He, he's in his late 70s, uh, and he's uh, one of the best known conservative evangelical clergymen in, in England. But, but there's a history to this, because in 2012, a woman called Anne, Anne Atkins, who's a very well-known conservative evangelical commentator. She's on Radio 4 quite a lot. Uh, she wrote two articles, one in 2012 and I think one in 2017. And she said there's something really badly wrong in the conservative evangelical world in the Ewan camps. Now, now Ewan is spelled I-W-E-R-E, I-W-E-R-N-E, Iwern, but but pronounced Ewan, a bit like Worcestershire. Sh -sh -sh. Anyway, it, it's a... It, we may have to put it up. Well, but, what, what are the camps? Just bring people up to speed who don't attend. Okay, the, the, so these, these, these are camps for young, upper-middle-class men who've been to the most uh, posh, pretentious public schools. It's a very thin layer of the uppermost crust of evangelical, uh, socially... I, was, what, I don't, don't use the word pretentious. Um, now, they, they hit... So, so this woman, Anne Atkins, said in 2011 that there's some real problems there. There are two people who are abusing young men uh, and nothing happened. She wrote about it again in 2017 and said they're still there. <laughs> they still haven't been caught. And then Smythe came to light and Smythe was clearly one of them. And he had taken boys aside and, and beaten them on the bottom, drawn blood, all in the name of some sadomasochistic pseudo spiritual fantasy he had. And the problem with the Smythe was that, that the reverberations ran right up to Justin Welby because he had been one of the helpers at these camps. And the question was, did you know about this? And to begin with, Justin Welby said, well, he was a bare acquaintance. And then it turned out they'd been on camp quite a lot together, so he was clearly more than that. And Welby said he was clearly more than that. But that's as far as the tide went. The problem is that this other man who's been named for spiritual abuse in the Telegraph this last week was an equally prominent person. His brother uh, ran the camps uh, and he, he had been there for the last 30 His years. His father was a cabinet minister in the Labour government for the mid-70s yeah. of Harold Wilson. So the, the We're talking about the establishment gap. Yeah. The, 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 uh, well, and he also belonged to called club and if I get it wrong, that's because I was never asked to join it. But you members of, of the this caste club system, are, huh? I'm afraid not. Members of this club include the man in question, Nicky Gumbel, Justin Welby, several cabinet ministers. They meet in the uh, guards room at Lambeth Palace once every three months, and it's it's top secret. It's so top secret I can't get the name right. But they're part of a club. They know each other immensely well, uh, not not just at the UN camps. Now, the, the problem is... Um, there are two problems. One is that the news about this man, Sado... Um, the, the, homoerotic. The, 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 homo Homoerotic uh, pastoral engagements with young men of a manipulative and blackmailing kind are beginning to break surface. Now, because they were all over 16, there's nothing criminal about this. But from a psychological and pastoral point of view, the thing is really very rotten indeed. Now, the difficulty is that that many of the people who hold senior office in the conservative evangelical world are closely related to this man and were either victims of his engaging in these sexual activities by manipulation uh, or else they knew a lot about it. Do anything. The problem is it's just about to break into the public sphere. So what we have is we, we have members of this, you might call it a magic circle or an inner group, writing letters saying, Look, this is about to break surface. This man's had his uh, this man's had his his permission to officiate withdrawn. Don't invite him. He's not safe. Some of you are still inviting. Go on, George. The allegations, as we have 
been hearing them, and these are allegations. Uh, we have no, uh, first, we have no direct experience. Uh, essentially, this is an evangelical version of the Peter Ball affair. Absolutely. Now, and remember, Peter Ball was criminally charged and was sentenced to prison, um, and his victims were almost all of consenting age, and one of the charges that stuck with him was abuse of office. So that when we, we're not blithely dismissing this activity as being uh, it's criminal, therefore it's good. It's not criminal in the sense it wasn't statutory rape of a minor, but uh, there are consequences to this that we could see ra ramifications. Uh, it's the Ball case entrapped Prince Charles. Prince Charles was not part of Ball's mm -hmm. inner circle of uh, perverts. Prince Charles wasn't... Uh, facilitating anything. He was captivated by this charming man, uh, helped his career, gave him a place to live, considered him a friend, a mentor, a spiritual director, guide. And now Prince Charles, every time this Peter Ball story comes up, his picture is on this article too, because he's been tainted by association. And it looks like we're going to see a conservative evangelical equivalent to the Peter Ball affair with many connections within the evangelical community not just within england but internationally and i think that's the biggest ramification here is uh like when we saw um, amia fall we saw all the different connections uh within africa and around the world of other places that uh had a lot of difficulty with the news that there was corruption within amia I think there's going to be a lot of difficulty with the news of who this person was, who he knew, and who potentially his victims are as they're writing letters now. Well, right. if I may jump in, Gavin, and just the, I'm frankly I'm not interested in the person. You know, I'm that's why one reason why I'm not naming names at the individual. He will meet his maker. If the police take this up, he will go through all of that. I'm more concerned with the concerted cover-up by those in authority who are aware of the stories. Um, in two, 2017, the Diocese of Southwark re removed his permission to officiate, meaning the diocese knew about the charges, the diocese knew what was going on. He had now retired, so he didn't have a job that he could be fired from. But he still would be called to preach and teach and go to conferences and classes and like this man was still mixing in the evangelical <clears throat> world and in april of this year four senior conservative evangelical leaders including people who had come out of his church rod thomas uh the bishop of maidstone uh vaughn roberts uh, uh gavin help me with the rest Rec of the names Rec rector of st ebbs william yeah. taylor mm -hmm. rector of st helens and robin weeks Minister of Emmanuel Church, Proprietary Chapel, Wimbledon. These four wrote a letter. They, they wrote a letter saying, stay far away, that the bishop, permission to officiate has been removed and we think was a good idea. And what has happened is, when did they know this? Uh, what do they know? Um, and are we going to see that magic circle broken apart and with it, uh, a portion of the evangelical movement within England. Well, see, what one has to say, first of all, well done. T two years after this man was suspended, they chose to write a letter, write a letter warning people. Uh, they said, um, we are aware that he's continued to be invited in his churches, in schools and other contexts, and this is not appropriate. So two years later, they in April this year, they sent this letter out. But the problem is, they know a great deal more than that. I mean, the fact is, they'll know the whole story. How, why? Because I know the whole story. Why? Because people in distress have been talking to clergy, uh, and the scale of this, which is as bad as Peter Ball's, uh, is, is, is so large that it would be impossible not to know the story uh, if you're at all connected with some of these people. Now, so on the one hand, congratulations for taking some action. But the problem is, what they're, what they're doing is they're trying to keep a lid on it and hide it away. Uh, and, and, and that won't work. Um, one of the things that is to be hoped, perhaps if we achieve something from, from uh, following up on the, on the public 
public on the publication in the Daily Telegraph, the breaking of the surface, is to say to the church, look, you know what happened with the Peter Ball affair. It caused so much damage. This is the same thing happening again. You have to bring it out into the open and tell the truth. Apart from anything else, some of the signatures, uh, some of the people involved were were his victims. Essentially, they've been engaged in condoning this form of, uh, which ranged from sexual horseplay to, to something much more serious. Uh, and they themselves will be having to work through the implications of having been involved with somebody who was so spiritually helpful to them at the same time so profoundly abusive. So one of the things that's quite clear is that the conservative evangelical part of the church, this magic circle, uh, has to tell the truth. One of the reasons why they may not want to tell the truth is because some of the people are themselves involved and, and it almost certainly goes right up to Justin Welby. One, yeah. of, the, one of the victims of John, uh, John Smythe uh, put out a tweet saying that, uh, I, I don't know how old it was, uh, Gavin, you may have seen this, saying that there were six active abusers in this Ewan circle. Ewan circle. Smythe <clears throat> is one of them. He's been named. The second person has now been named. So there are four others. It was October the 3rd, 2017. A man named Andy, who was one of the victims. I won't use his full name. Uh, he, I've read his Twitter feed, and he's, he's psychologically very fragile. Uh, he said, I know that Smythe was one of six abusers of Ewan. I've not named the other five in any tweets or on YouTube. The Archbishop of Canterbury can verify. So there are a number of people who are, who are sh certain, that's too strong a word, who are, who are saying that the Archbishop of Canterbury himself knows, knows the whole truth about the sexual abuse that took place at Ewan. He knew about Smythe. He knows about the man in question. He'll know about the others. What are they going to do to clean up the church? Now, let me talk from a from a priest's perspective. Uh, Gavin has mentioned uh, that so Gavin comes into this sort of an Episcopal perspective because there are clergy within England who come to him for Episcopal pastoral and spiritual oversight. They may not be members of his diocese, but they look upon him and act as if he were their bishop. There are clergy who have come to him and said, look, these, these victims have come to me. And my problem is that the people who I would name as the perpetrators are people in the hierarchy. I mean, and we've seen how this has worked in the past. We've seen the Archbishop of York lose files on a convicted uh, pedophile. Oh, it was it was damaged in the flood of mm -hmm. 2016. The the credibility in safeguarding, um, or or see the Church of England, its credibility is non-existent. It either ignores or condones by closing one's eyes or picks sacrificial victims uh, like George Bell, the former Bishop of Chichester, or Christopher Lowson, the current mm. Bishop of Lincoln, who has been suspended from office because he's an imminent threat, like this this man is can't be trusted in a, in a room with children. He's the Bishop of Lincoln, even though the Church of England said, well, there's no imminent danger, but we're going to suspend him anyway because the standard is that he's an imminent danger. It either goes so far out or it ignores it and it I seems like if you went to one of these camps you're not going to be touched there's a yes. disappear file you know go put it in the disappear file in the cabinet and that's what happens to a lot of these complaints i and think the thing that makes me so angry about the george bell of case is that it's it's perfectly clear from the judicial inquiry that george bell's uh, innocence is is beyond any reasonable doubt at all and the inference, therefore, is that, is that Archbishop Welby is using George Bell as a kind of lightning conductor by appearing to be very hard indeed on a dead malefactor who can't answer back, but who, after due proper investigation, has been declared innocent. He appears to be earning himself credit as somebody who is dealing with these moral issues in a, in a, a, a powerful and way that's beyond reproach. But the fact is that he's part of an inner circle that is protecting uh, uh, prote protecting people who engage in very, very serious abuse. And the thing about the, the Christian church is we get saved if we repent. In one sense, it's really quite wonderful. We just have to say we're sorry and, and, and apologize to the Lord and to one another. And the miracle is we then get to move on. But, but penitence is absolutely required. 
we are not throwing stones in judgment what we're saying is the church must be true to its own integrity uh, and involve and, and start telling the truth and repenting this 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 is not just a church of england problem because its tentacles reach into the gafcon movement uh we're expecting uh, a letter shortly from uh, a leader of the anglican mission in england a subsidiary of gafcon of this and as my understanding uh, gavin perhaps you can fill in a bit bit more about because this the, the the intensity of the talk surrounding this is such that we just can't they just can't shrug it off and go on um, the is, is, is gafcon uk fatally damaged is the amie fatally damaged by keeping silent over things its leaders knew were occurring well i was going to say george it's not fatally damaged if they choose to tell the truth the problem is that the two leading bishops are rod thomas and andy lines and, and both of them have were were part of this man's church and, and therefore are pretty closely linked to it. How closely? I, I'm not able to say. I wouldn't well, dream Kevin, of saying. Let, let's, let's, no, no, look, we, we need to be... You knew Peter Ball. Could, you, could they yeah. know Mr. X the way you knew Peter Ball? Or you see where i'm going in other words is this guilt by association or are we I, saying this more? I, do you know i i don't mean to be mealy mouthed I, I really i don't want to say apart from saying that that that, that, that they were they're very closely connected with his ecclesiastical establishment i don't know what they say but but let's let's wait and see if in andy Lyons's pastoral letter he's able to deal with this in a way that allows enough light in for the situation to find some way of being healed or uh, will he do what Vaughan Roberts and William Taylor uh, Robin Weeks and uh, and Rod Thomas did and that is simply deal with it obliquely and ask people and tell people to be to be aware um, in our judgment that that simply isn't enough that won't cut it well, it, I'll just take this farther afield. I mean, part of the problem is, look what's happening in Hong Kong. The perception is the Archbishop of Hong Kong is compromised by the Chinese Communist Party. Therefore, his voice is non-existent at a time when Christianity is the stand against the oppression of the communist regime in Peking. We've seen bishops who are compromised be used by hostile governments, be used by, we see this in the Catholic Church scandal. Bishops are compromised and they are protected. And part of the price of protection is that they go along with the system that protects them. Well, I, 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 I don't want to be afraid that we're getting ahead of the story. I want to see what the letters say uh, before we, you know, put too much, you know, credibility or lack of credibility into the into the stories um i don't want to jump down the road and say they're compromised because we haven't read their letters yet it's going to be interesting to watch the response now from the church of england if they finally respond uh from gafcon if they feel that they need to respond to this any uh tentacles into the acna uh, will be interesting to watch this is one of the stories that we hate to report on and I assume in a week or two we'll be naming his name uh, when it's more public. We'll have to find out. Um, well, or we can wait till after the next coronation and uh, once things settle down a bit. <laughs> Kevin, if I, I don't think it's quite right. I mean, his name is completely public. Okay. It's posted all over the, the front page of a daily newspaper. One of the reasons we're not naming the names yet, as I understand it, is because the people most closely involved in church circles have yet to to acknowledge and to deal with what's happening. They, they're, they're still thinking about it. I, I, somebody sent me a, 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 a note today saying, Gavin, do you realize that the most senior members of the conservative evangelical group who, pre who preside over appointments for one another, they're all connected with this man in one way or another. They're either all involved and, 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 and were, were, were problematically involved in the homoerotic game playing that went on or, or they know about it and have done nothing and the, what that means is that, that, that to belong to this circle of highly influential wealthy uh, successful uh, conservative evangelicalism you have to keep silent 
about what happened. And I think that's what George means about being compromised. And, and what, you know, so, so we began by saying, silence won't work. Look what happened to Peter Ball. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. And when I'm listening to the stories and the stuff we said before the show, how uh, connected these stories seem to be between um, Peter and the unnamed gentleman, it's kind of the same modus operandi. And hmm. that that scares me to think about what's happened in, the, in these little cliques in England where uh, the sexual sin seems to be the same. Uh, something we'll have to talk about in the future. Guys, anything else we want to say to before we close off the program here? We've done quite a bit. How about Lord, we pray at Lord, the end of the Lord, day that Lord, God Lord, can be should, glorified should, in this? Should yes. we give them uh, Alan... Uh, Haley's address for uh, yeah, service of, uh, uh, of yeah. a libel complaint oh, or uh... yeah, boy. Well, they, you can't libel us. We're we're, we're well, I think... proof. We have no assets. <laughs> yeah, so we have no assets. We collect nothing. <laughs> but we will. We will. I imagine put links to the articles we've referred to that are in the public domain. Yeah, is that what we're going to do? That's or what we'll we do. Wait, we'll put we'll them wait. in. We'll put them in the show notes. If you go to our YouTube channel, uh, you'll see the links in the show notes. A little description of the of this uh, kind of the Nixtonian moment for the Anglican Church. Uh, when did they know? And what did they know? When did they know it? I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to Anglican Unscripted, two hundred and no, 513 <laughs> on the 25th of June. <laughs> Too many of my brain cells are, are engaged in thinking about other things and pray for us, for we too are sinners. Mm -hmm.